So we're in the middle of talking about membrane lipids, and we've just finished glycerophospholipids. We'll make a note that they're used for making membranes. And here's the five glycerophospholipids, like phosphatidic acid and phosphatidylethanolamine, so on and so forth. Those are the ones we talked about. And what we're going to do now is move on and talk about a similar class of molecules, also membrane lipids. And those are going to be called the sphingolipids. Remember, these are all in the capacity of amphipathic molecules. That is, those that have a large polar and a large nonpolar section. So when you think of amphipathic, think membranes. And when you think of membranes, think amphipathic. Let's go on and talk about sphingolipids. Now, sphingolipids, in some ways, are very similar to glycerophospholipids. Let's make a note of the name here. Sphingolipids, or SL, we sometimes call them. Take a look at the structure of by the cartoon over here. We have two nonpolar tails, a backbone to which uh, a fatty acid is attached, and then so far we have some polarity up there. Not a very strong at this point, but uh, you can see the two nonpolar tails and polar head, that's going to be what gives us the similarity to glycerophospholipids. But it turns out the components are largely different and the linkages are two. Uh, let's start with the backbone. Remember, the glycerophospholipids had a three carbon backbone to which two fatty acids were esterified. And that's not how sphingolipids work. In fact, what we're going to have is a 18 carbon backbone called sphingosine. Now, sphingosine is what we have drawn here. It is simply the backbone. Let's make a note of that because students get that mixed up all the time. Let's put down backbone only and recognize that we're going to build onto sphingosine to make a sphingolipid. Now, I'm going to take you through the next part. Notice the cartoon has a L-shaped backbone. So here's like the three carbons that you'd expect for glycerol, but then the backbone keeps going for a total of 18 carbons. In fact, it's just a carbon chain of 18 carbons. And what we have, therefore, is it kind of goes around the corner and see there's no fragile linkage there because this is not attached by an ester or something like that, which can be broken. Carbon-carbon bonds are really tough. This is going to be a single unit, and it's not going to break down very easily. However, we are going to attach a fatty acid to this backbone, and we're going to do it through a linkage we've learned about in the past. I want you to try to add a fatty acid to this backbone. See if you can do it. Uh, to kind of make this cartoon right here. It's going to have to be thinking outside the box here a little bit, but let's pause and have you give it a try. Okay, I hope you paused the video and, and tried it. Uh, remember, fatty acids are attached to other things by their carboxylates, and we can attach carboxylates to a lot of different things. In fact, there's two alcohols out here. We could have sterified them out there, but if we did that, you would have the fatty acid over here, and you wouldn't have two alcohols. Instead, we're going to attach the fatty acid, believe it or not, to this amine. And what we're going to see is this kind of thing. We're going to take an amine and a carboxylic acid, and we are going to attach it like that. And then we'll have some long chain fatty acid. I don't know. We'll just put a bunch of carbons on there like that. Could be 16, 18, 14 carbons. It could have double bonds. It may not. Whatever. That's not really important. What's important is we've attached a fatty acid by this linkage right here. Do you remember what that kind of linkage is called? An amine and a carboxylate take away a water. When we did that with amino acids, we call it a peptide bond. But in all other circumstances, it's simply called an amide or amide. And at this point, we've accomplished quite a bit. We have a backbone that provides not only the backbone, but one of the long carbon tails, and then a fatty acid acylated, that is attached by an amide to that amine. So, so far we have this piece over here. 
And actually, this right here is one of the four sphingolipids that I'd like you to be familiar with. It's a very simple one. It's called ceramide. Ceramide is just sphingosine with a fatty acid on the nitrogen. And that's the easiest one. It's only two components. But like we did on the other page with glycerophospholipids, we can attach other things and make other sphingolipids. For instance, let's say we took a ceramide and had this alcohol over here and attached a phosphate and then an ethanolamine out here. If we did that, this would be something called a sphingomyelin. I wonder if you've ever heard that term myelin. Maybe uh, see if you can tuck that away in your brain and think about what kind of uh, what, what that brings to mind. Let's also make note that in this particular case, we have a phosphodiester there, two phosphoesters overlapping on one phosphate. So that head group is very much like phosphatidylethanolamine that we saw on the other page. Okay, let's move on. We're going to take a ceramide like we had above, and this time we're going to attach a sugar without a phosphate, just a sugar, and what we end up with is called a cerebricide. And could you identify this sugar? It's got six carbons. It's a D sugar. It's uh, an aldose because carbon number one is the anomeric. And it's an alpha sugar here, an alpha uh, coming off the one carbon there. This is a down, up, down. That's a glucose. And we typically have glucose or galactose in this case. There's another interesting uh, name there. We've got myelin and now cerebro. What's, what's that bring into your mind? Let's say we take a ceramide and keep going. We add more sugars. Uh, we can put a lot of sugars on, maybe four like we have here, or 10 or 20. We can build up a large branched uh, sugar structure. And if we have more than one sugar like we have here, it's called a ganglioside. And maybe have you heard the term ganglion or ganglio? Uh, that's another hint for us here. So uh, if you have one sugar on there, it's a cerebricide. If you have more than one sugar, anything more than one, it's a ganglioside. Now, these names, like I've been underlining there in red, I hope that gives some clue to what we're talking about here. And that is sphingolipids are membrane components but they're typically found in neuronal tissues. And the first clue was sphingomyelin, myelin being the myelin sheath that covers axons of nerves and insulates them. So you may have heard that before in your biology classes. So those are the four sphingolipids, and they all have a sphingosine core uh, backbone, one fatty acid as an acyl group with an amine, uh, that is in the form of an amide linkage, and then either no head group or various other head groups that we see down here. And that gets us something highly similar. Two long nonpolar tails and a somewhat polar head group.